Welcome back to the Neuroscience Meets Social and Emotional Learning podcast, episode number 69 with Ben Ample, a U.S. certified neuroscience coach and neuro-linguistic programming trainer who I've watched all over the news this weekend. Even though he's located in the Philippines, his positive message about using your brain to manage your behavior is having a global impact and following. My name is Andrea Samadhi, and if you're new here, I'm a former educator who created this podcast to bring the most current neuroscience research, along with high-performing experts who've risen to the top of their field with specific strategies or ideas that you can implement immediately to take your results to the next level. I am beyond excited to speak with Ben Ample today, and we've been chatting about our topic the past week or so, adding new thoughts or ideas to his message as things in the world are changing on a daily basis, but Ben's message remains consistent. He has had extensive corporate experience in the various cross-functional disciplines of general management and a variety of industries, and has also been a keynote speaker in conferences in neuroscience in London and in Bangkok. His background and speaking history is top-notch. And I know he'll share some insights to make us think differently after this interview about the best ways for us to manage our behavior with our brain and mind. Welcome, Ben, all the way from the Philippines. Andrea, it's so good to see you. You too, Ben. This was so much fun setting up this interview and making sure we had the correct time zone. You are so right. Nothing is going to stop us professionals with this 15-hour time difference. I would like to say Mabuhay, which is our national greeting. It means long life, but it's a, a very respectful and it's a greeting reserved for people who are family to us. So Mabuhay to you, Andrea. It's Tagalog, Filipino. And magandang umaga, good morning to where you are. It's 8 p.m. where I am here in the Philippines. 15-hour time difference, but it's like you and I are just next-door neighbors. We are think alike, like-minded, like, and we also share the same passion for life. It's truly a pleasure to meet you, virtually. Thank you, Ben. It has been a pleasure. We just have this connection that is... It, it just is eye-opening that people all over the world, we're all connected. And yeah, yeah, when yes. we connect together, we just found our similarities, and it is a powerful experience. Thank you it so is. much. So, Ben, since connecting with you on LinkedIn, I noticed so many similarities with how much we're both passionate about the topic of neuroscience it's an area that I lose track of time when I'm learning and studying and I spend all my spare time with it. And I've been learning from you with what you've been posting and sharing. What got you interested and passionate about the field of neuroscience? First of all, Andrea, I learned from you with what you're sharing. Your, your podcast is really top notch. I'm glad that we were connected over LinkedIn and I'm sure this will not be the last time we will be speaking. The brain learns visually. So with your permission, may I share my screen? Yes. So this is where we are right now. The brain is only the one, the organ that defines us. It determines our personality. It also determines how we think and how we behave. Yet most people know more about how their phones work than they do how their brains work, which is actually ironic. The United Nations and the World World Health Organization has mentioned that mental wellness will be the next pandemic after COVID. COVID has really put everybody globally on, the, on a very stressful environment on such a prolonged nature. So the stress becomes chronic and traumatic. And unless you provide your listeners tools and concepts, this will not go away by itself. So that got me interested into neuroscience. Uh, if we were in a jungle and we were compared to animals and we we're facing COVID, uh, whom would you put your bet on to survive? We're not the tallest. The giraffe would have that um, distinction. We're not the largest. The elephant would be that. We're not the strongest. The lion would be that. We're not the fastest. We cannot fly and we cannot swim. We cannot camouflage ourselves. But throughout history, we've seen Jurassic Park, the top hit of the 1980s. The dinosaurs, which are mighty creatures, they were already long gone extinct. But the human being, we are 
the surviving species of the planet. And it's only because of one thing, our brain. Our brain has enabled us to survive and thrive despite all of the crisis that we've been through. And I'm sure that this COVID crisis, this too shall pass because of our brains and because of the United Front that all the countries are putting into it. We have learned more about the brain, the human brain in the last five years than we have in the entire history of man. Because of technology, we are now able to see into the workings of the brain in real time. So we have learned more about the brain than we have had before. Neuroscience has been around for 40 years, but it's only now that technology has enabled us to speak. And you were sharing before that you, it keeps you up at night. Same with me. There's never a day that goes by that a new finding, a new research discovery on how the brain works is uh, published. Just this morning, they were publishing that how you breathe has an impact on the way your memory is stored. So that is actually just uh, something very fascinating. The way we breathe actually dictates how our memories are formed. No matter how much effort we put in, if we use the wrong tool, we will not get good results. And our brain is the one thing that we need in order to survive this crisis and any crisis that we'll be getting onto. So because of that, I got into neuroscience, as you mentioned in your intro. I was using neuro-linguistic programming before. And that is uh, a set of behavior that was observed. Neuroscience is actually a set of behavior that was observed clinically in the lab because of measurements. So if we don't use the right tools, no matter how much effort we put in, we will not get the good results. And it's, it's a high time now that we understand how the brain works because the human brain has never been challenged. There are uh, the top two causes of suicide will be number one, economic despair, number two, social disconnection. And we have had a lot of crises in recent history. The first is, uh, I won't go into the flu pandemic that was a century ago. The ones that you and I could relate to, Andrea, would be the New York City bombing of 9-11. That was uh, totally devastating, but it has localized. Social, dis uh, social disconnection and economic despair did not happen at the same time. We also had the 1998 Asian financial crisis and the 2008 global financial crisis. Uh, social disconnection and economic despair did not happen at the same time. COVID brought those two elements simultaneously. So right now we have a global population full of very stressed citizens. And I'm sure that with the advocacy you're doing your science that you would be able to help your listeners now in order to give them tools relevant and tangible to cope. When what I want to do with my neuroscience advocacy is to demystify it. I graduated from engineering. I'm not a doctor at all, but I want to demystify it and enable the ordinary person. Well, it's, it's so interesting because in the past, nobody ever said, Andrea, you know, you with the goals you're setting, how are you using your brain? So suddenly we now need to understand this part of our body that I never thought about until someone pointed out to me, you really need to go this direction. And he was a, a school administrator. And he said, I'd really like you to go this direction with the work you're doing. And he started pulling all these books off his shelf. Like one of them was David Souza's How the Brain Learns. And wow, there was all these different books, like How the ELL Brain Learns, The Gifted Brain Learns. And if I was to open it up, it was pretty intense, like all these charts and graphs. And, and it first glance with no background on this topic, it can be overwhelming. But it, isn't it true that once we just get a basic handle of the three main parts of the brain and how it works, that anybody could understand this topic, right? That's absolutely correct. We so, could not demystify it. Absolutely. Can you break it down a little bit? So I've been doing a lot of podcasts on taking a look at the fact that we not only need to change our behavior, but we need to change our paradigm. So things that have been ingrained in us over decades. Can you explain how our brain works with your acronym BATMAN? And keep in mind, we don't want to just change our behavior that doesn't get the results we're looking for, but change some old ways of thinking, old beliefs that might be keeping us stuck. 
with pleasure, Andrea. The brain learns uh, primarily th through images. That's why I use a lot of visual slides in my presentations. And also one key with uh, adult learning is use humor and absurdity. That's why I use Batman. The brain also learns with chunking. That's why when you're managing or trying to grapple with uh, phone numbers, we have the habit of grouping them to groups of three or four digits. If we were able, if we're trying to group them into the full eight digits or credit card number, 16 digits, we'd have a hard time. Another application of chunking is to the use of acronyms. That's why Batman, we have three acronyms for tonight, Batman, SCORE, and SCAR. And I assure you, Andrea, after this podcast, if you're top, top uh, ranking, I might point out to your avid fans. And I, I'm glad to, I'm really honored to be a guest on your top ranking podcast globally. I assure you that your participants, your listeners would remember what Batman stands for, what SCORE stands for, and what SCARP stands for, and we'll be able to understand how the brain works. So the, we have three acronyms, Batman, SCORE, and SCARP. Um, we also have been exposed to the COVID and a lot of uh, praise and respect has gone out to the frontliners. We also have frontliners for our body and that is Batman. What we mean is that our brain and neuroscience can be defined by remembering the acronym Batman. Neuroscience is simply the study of the brain and how it acts and thinks so that you can manage your behavior, your actions and thoughts. So there you go. Just remember Batman and you'll be able to understand with technical precision. This is not a contrived definition by any means. Uh, neuroscience is simply the study of the B brain, how it A acts and how it B thinks so that you can man, manage your actions and your thoughts. Now, how is the brain program? I, I didn't graduate from a medical degree. I have an engineering degree. We will just tackle two areas of the brain for this uh, discussion, Andrea, the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. The amygdala is, uh, they're shaped like beans. They come in pairs and they're in the middle of our ears. And the cortex is what gives our brain the crumpled look. So the prefrontal cortex is in front of our forehead. So we have the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. The amygdala is reactive. It's quite impulsive, whereas the PFC is reflective. So when we mean reactive, when you see a cobra, you will just react. You will not think anymore and do, do a SWOT analysis or look at your grocery list or your to-do list. You will just run. And when we say that the prefrontal cortex is reflective, if somebody were to ask you 17 times 24, with the advent of the phone and the calculator, we've forgotten basic mathematical skills. We might have to get a piece of paper and scratch our head and analyze, try to figure out what 17 times 24 would be, would result into. So let's try to give them characters. So I'll, amygdala, I'd like to call it MIGS. It's impulsive, it's emotional. The frontal cortex, I'll call him text. He is analytical, he is serious, he's cognitive. The MIGS is the earliest part of the brain that was developed. Text was not there during the caveman uh, uh, species. When they were excavating remains of our ancient uh, ancestors, they only found mix. There was not there any component of text. Text developed over time as the need for it arose. In fact, not all animals have text. Not all animals have cortex. Uh, we are the animal, we are the species with the largest PFC by volume. Humans have 67% or two thirds of our brain area is actually composed of the cortex area. The next species with the largest PFC by volume is the whale. The whale has 17% by volume of PFC. So mix is the earliest. And based on that, you will also know what kind of programming he had. Back in the day, they, they didn't have to contend with Wi-Fi, uh, Starbucks or whatever. They just had to contend with finding food and defending themselves from threats like tigers. So mix is very emotional, X is analytical. The programming of mix is similar to the caveman days, it's simply to keep us alive. Our brain is not programmed to make us happy. That is uh, something that really jolted me when I found out about that. Our brain's primary function is like a frontliner 
Our brain's primary function is to keep us alive. If we're alive, then we can talk about happiness. But if we're dead, no sense in looking for happiness. So the primary conditioning of the brain is to keep us alive. And it does that by looking out for threats, whether real or imaginary. So if you think about people who are engaged in road rage, people who are otherwise respectable and highly educated, and then somebody cuts into them in the highway and they lose their composure and start shooting down uh, people, that's because the person cutting them in the highway was perceived by MIGs as a threat, even though it's just an imaginary threat. Also, MIGs has a 10-second lead time over text. So what our mothers used to tell us that when you're angry, count to 10, that's a scientific basis. So when you're angry, example, you're experiencing road rage, count to 10 slowly, 1,001, 1,002. And after you reach 10, text would come into the picture and then you can now analyze and say, should I really be angry with that person cutting me in? Otherwise, if you're just up to nine, Migs is still in the driver's seat and he will just uh, react impulsively. And he does that by looking for threats similar to a radar. And right now, enough, the biggest threat is the COVID virus. And he looks out for threats, whether it's real or imaginary. And if he finds any threat, he reacts to the three Fs. He either freezes or the flight or the fight. We're all familiar with that. None of those are rational. So you see the reindeer eyes in the headlights, that's freezing. So sometimes there's a threat and you just freeze. So if you're talking to somebody in a meeting and he just stops talking, perhaps he perceives something in the meeting as a threat or somebody runs away, somebody picks up a fight. Those are the three primary responses, the fear response, that when mix is activated, these are the three apps that you, you have to choose from. It triggers the fear response and when that happens, tech shuts down, meaning our cognitive, rational, analytical, cool, composed ability to make decisions is totally shut down. So the challenge is this, mix is very emotional, mix is very instinctive. And there were so many threats because the threats are either real, a tiger, a snake in the road, or imaginary. Uh, perhaps somebody sneezing and you think that there's COVID in the air. So whether the threat is real or imaginary, mix will kick up the fear response of freezing of uh, fleeing or flight and fighting. And none of them are resourceful. So if you're a leader and your team is activating their fear response, they would act in fear and you would not be able to draw the optimal performance from them because their rational brain shuts down. What does the brain seek? The brain seeks the second acronym, SCORE. Remember Michael Jordan? He always tries to score. And we all remember the hit on Netflix about the last dance. SCORE stands for survival. Our brain is programmed for survival. It's constantly on the lookout for threats, whether real or perceived. So if you want to protect yourself uh, from coronavirus, you might want to wear a face mask and cover all the orifices of your head. The second one is certainty. The brain craves for certainty, and right now we're facing so much uncertainty. We don't know when the vaccine will be discovered. We don't, don't know when it's going to deploy. There are many countries right now that are, that are experiencing the second wave of the virus. We don't know if we're opening the economy in the right time and fashion. This is the way we had options before COVID. There's a portion that we can control. There's a portion that we cannot control in the gray area. When COVID started, 99% of everything we cannot control anymore. So our brain is uh, kicked up in high uncertainty fashion, and that's very stressful. There's more stress that the brain feels over uncertainty than stress over certainty of a bad thing happening. Let me say that again. We experience more stress over uncertainty than with the certainty of something bad going to happen. If I'm supposed to have a colonoscopy tomorrow, that, that's a very uncomfortable procedure. It's bad. But I know I'm going to have it tomorrow, so I'm certain about it. And I will not be stressed as much as if my relative told, uh, gives me a message, uh, Ben, please pray for me. I just had a biopsy. I pray that the tumor will not be malignant. It will be benign. Because of uncertainty, I will feel more stressed over that than with the certainty of me going to have a colonoscopy tomorrow. That's just hypothetical. Next is relationships. So SCR, 
Relationships, uh, we are social beings. Our ancestors, the cavemen, formed tribes. In fact, the empires that conquered the world before, the Mongolian, the Romans, they were actually allegiances and coalitions of tribes. That's why social distancing, lock, lock ins in your house, that is against the brain programming. That's why we're feeling so stressed. Social isolation is also a very strong predictor of early death. And they did a study that lonely people tend to die sooner. The average lifespan of a male is 74 years old right now. For females, it's 78. But if you're lonely, you will, according to studies, you might pass on sooner than that. So social distancing is like we're floating in the universe, the COVID universe. That's not how the brain is programmed for. This is what we had before. This is had what we had after COVID. We don't want to be on the moon. We will not catch COVID on the moon because no one's sneezing in us, but we're gonna be alone and isolated. We don't want to be alone in the jungle as well. We want to seek companionship. So again, the brain six score, that is S, survival, C, certainty, and then R, relationships. And what did we get during COVID? We were seeking for score, survival, certainty and relationships, we got COVID overload. We didn't get survival, we didn't get certainty, and we didn't get relationships. The prior to uh, the onset of neuroscience, people thought that the brain is hardwired, meaning the brain that we were born in is the brain that we're going to die with. But with the advent of technology, they now discovered that the brain is actually malleable. It's like modeling clay. The brain is actually soft-wired. And you can actually program your brain with what they call neuroplasticity. With, if you keep on thinking about a thought and acting a behavior consistently and repeatedly over time, neural connections or brain connections in your brain will form, and that will form a mindset or a habit. And uh, it's like toasted bread. There's a program for the bread, how much time you have to toast it. If you keep it too short, it will be under toasted. Whereas if you keep it in the toaster too long, it's going to be burned. 66 days is what it takes for neural connections to be cemented. We're now past 66 days. Manila, the Philippines, has the distinction of having the longest quarantine. We're now running on our 90th day. So 66 days, all of the anxiety, stress that we've been looking and feeling because of the 24 by 7 negative news cycle, we are now neurally connect a uh, program for stress and anxiety. And that will lead to trauma unless it is cured and addressed. So what solutions can we look at? Um, I'm sure our listeners would not want to just listen to this and find out what problems they face. We are here to offer them practical evidence-based solutions. Again, Batman. So Batman, again, is the study of the brain, how it acts and how it thinks so that you can manage your behavior. How about managing ourselves and the behavior of others? How do we do that? We have to know what are the drivers that makes MIGS, the amygdala, agitated and triggers the fear response. If you're able to manage whatever triggers MIGS or the amygdala, then it's going to be text. Your rational brain that will take over and you can face life with more deliberateness and more purposefulness. So again, the acronym is SCARF. SCARF represents the five drivers that if you deprive a person of that, that will, that will trigger mix in the other person. S is for status. If somebody cuts while I'm driving the highway, somebody cuts into my lane, I might feel that I lost status. In the office background, a threat is that if you give an unsolicited advice to a colleague, he would say, you and I are just co-equal. I don't even report to you. How dare you give me your, your opinion? If I want your opinion, I'm going to ask for it. Doing so triggers a threat. Migs will be agitated. A reward is if you offer a positive feedback, then you would calm down Migs. Certainty uh, is we want certainty, as we said before, the brain craves for patterns and certainty. So what's the threat? If you don't establish clear guidelines, uh, we are now able to, we were working from home 100% prior to people being allowed to go back to the office, depending on what country you're in. Here in the Philippines, it's 50% of the total workforce. But people who are going back to the office may not be given clear 
guidelines what to expect. So a threat will be fear, uh, field and mix will get threatened. Our reward is that if you give them, guys, you're the leader. Guys, I totally have no idea what the future holds. But I admit with you, I'm giving you the certainty that I will be very forthcoming to you and I will tell you whatever I know. Even that alone will give them certainty and that will calm down mix. Ace autonomy. We all want a sense of control. We don't want things to just be imposed upon us. So a threat is if you ma micromanage um, somebody's work, he would feel that I went to school, I'm not a child, like I know how to do my work, and mix the amygdala will be threatened. A reward is if you allow them to do their own thing, like work from home as long as they deliver their, uh, their, their outputs well and according to your standards. And that R is relatedness. We all want to have a feeling of belongingness. The threat is if you exclude somebody in a meeting. Example, you and I are having a Zoom on one meeting, and one of our colleagues was not invited. Then he would feel that he's not even included, he's being ostracized. So his amygdala mix would be threatened if your response would go out. A reward is if you mentor a subordinate, you just take him under your wing and try to take him in as a student and friend. Then mix would be. Uh, would be calmed down. And finally, fairness. You all want to be treated with uh, equality and fairness. A threat is if you do practice double standards in your office, then those affected mix at the amygdala will be threatened. A reward is if you're very transparent in how you're managing your office. So again, mix, a scarf represents the five drivers that if you take this away from people, their amygdala or mix will be triggered and that will, uh, uh, that will force the amygdala to generate a fear response. So if I want to be a leader, I should make sure that I don't deprive my team of their status. I provide them certainty. I give them autonomy, uh, ability to make choices. I give them certainty and I treat them with fairness. Well, this is very powerful, Ben, to start out with this. So. I'm just going to recap because with Batman, I got that we've got to understand that there's the part of the brain, the amygdala, where the fear comes from, and that shuts down our ability to think and reason. And we're going to be afraid of more than anything, we're going to be afraid of uncertainty that we're facing in the world today. And every day something is happening that is opening up this fear of an uncertainty, like wherever we are, you're in the Philippines and I'm here in Arizona and stuff is happening on a daily basis, whether we're in the corporate world or whether we're just operating our day to day lives. So the Batman, it really helps me to understand just the fact that what's happening, uh, even on a subconscious level, is that right? Like we, we don't, we might not even be aware of it was we're getting up and going about our daily activity, you go on the highway, suddenly something shut down and you, you don't, you don't you might not even know how you're reacting, but your brain goes into fear and then suddenly you're not thinking right. Is that that's that correct. a good way to, and so then for overcoming these fears that we're experiencing every day, what, what would be a good thing for me to do um, you know, I don't know what, what about people that they're not sure if their job is going to be here today or tomorrow. And this f fear or threat is a daily thing for them. What could we do for this? Uh, the, the scarf is actually twofold, Andrea. And that's a very good question. This is actually a key. These are the elements of effective leadership during COVID. And they are evidence-based because they're, uh, they're based on scientific research. If you go to a bookstore, whether brick or mortar or online, you can find a gazillion books about leadership. Most of them are opinion-based. Most of them are just observed behaviors, but none of them are based on how our brain's programming is affected. So as a leader, I as a leader would want to treat my team with status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. Now to your question, Andrea, if I'm feeling something, I'm feeling antsy, I'm feeling kind of down, but I couldn't put, wrap my head around it. This also provides a template for emotional mastery. So if I can't, if I was just uh, counseling a friend the other day, he was feeling rather down because of what's going on. And he couldn't really explain, he couldn't articulate what he's feeling down about. 
and I presented to him this car template. And I go, is your staff is threatened? And he goes, no, uh, is your certainty threat? And apparently, there was news locally that one of two major airlines would be laying off people, 50% of the workforce. And he worked for that airline company. So he is uncertain whether he's going to lose his job. And then autonomy, he, don't, he doesn't know in a very tight mar job market whether he could find work. His work is also very specialized. So the class of 2020 graduated class will be entering a very tight labor market. Even when the economy opens up, we have a lot of underemployed, those who were laid off in the graduating class, rushing in to fill very limited seats. So because of this car template, he was able to identify that it's certainty that is causing him grief. So with this template, we're able now to give people a sense of uh, check the triggers of your amygdala that is being agitated with the problem that you have. The, the one, the experience of a driver cutting us in the highway might fall under status. We might feel that, doesn't that guy know who I am? I'm a big shot in my company. How dare he cut into my lane? But when we count to 10 and then text, the prefrontal cortex kicks in, we gotta say, why will I let that person's behavior determine who I am? I am secure in who I am. My dogs love me regardless of whoever cuts me. So our status is again secure. So to your question, Andrea, these are actually good leadership uh, traits to emulate. Uh, practice these five traits as a leader. And if you're a follower and if you're a normal individual, these five uh, triggers would let you inspect and dissect the problem that you're experiencing so that you'll get a better handle on it. Moving forward, what can we do during this period of COVID? Although we're now uh, slowly opening up the economy, uh, Dr. Fauci is saying that the vaccine might be discovered and it's now in into human testing within the year. I would say practice self-care. Take care of yourself. Similar to when we used to ride the airplanes, they say that when the oxygen drops, put on your mask first, then assist the infants or elderly after that. So put on your mask first. We have another acronym, and the acronym is SELFISH. S is sleep. Uh, we are a sleep-deprived society, and sleep is the primary way our brains recharge. In fact, if you are sleep-deprived, there are so many negative things that happen to your brain and your body. Our memories are solidified during our sleep. So if you are sleep deprived, your memories will be malformed. I gave this lecture in the Valentine's uh, in my church this year uh, on Valentine's Day to the singles. I was telling them that if you are a lady and a, and a guy tells you, I'm losing sleep over you. I, I'm so in love with I'm losing sleep over you. And I dreamt last night that you and I are getting married. Knowing neuroscience, the girl can now say, first of all, you're sleep deprived. Secondly, your dreams are malformed. So leave me alone. So sir, all beings, uh, kidding aside, we should sleep. Mm -hmm. Stress makes us sleep less, but we don't want to be sleepless without any cause. So we should mind, we should just try to sleep seven to nine hours of restful sleep. Ease exercise. When we're locked in, uh, I live in a condominium here in Manila and I, I have to do my exercises indoors, but do exercise. The good thing is research has shown that it only takes 150 minutes, not even two hours. 150 minutes of medium ter medium pace exercise a week so that you will be invigorated. More is better, but if you just at, at least meet 150 minutes a week, you're checked, you're already okay for exercise. There is that. We're watching negative news cycles 24 by 7. Don't take life too seriously. Sure, there's a virus out there, but learn to laugh. And F is get food, healthy diet. Uh, admittedly, the Filipino breakfast doesn't fall in this category. The Mediterranean breakfast are rich in omega-3, rich in fish, salmon, and the like, vegetables. Those are good for your brain. And then I is invest in learning. Invest in creativity. Do puzzles. There's the saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. S is sunlight. Sunlight is good for your body and your brain. And being locked in in quarantine also deprives us of natural sunlight. And H finally is help others. 
helping others has been scientifically proven to release positive uh, neurotransmitters. The, those are chemicals of the brain that makes us feel good. So if I do a good deed today, I help another person, but I also feel good because my brain will release neurotransmitters that are, that are positive. So practice self-care, be selfish. Again, S is sleep, E is exercise, L is laugh, F is food, uh, I is invest in learning, S is sunlight, and H is uh, help others. Well, I love this because it goes in line with everything that I've been learning from some of the leaders in brain research, like Dr. Amen, who talks about, you know, how important it is that pretty much exercise and diet can solve any brain issue. Yes. Um, you know, and he's been on his Brain Warrior Way podcast, he's been talking about the power of sleep. So I love that idea of being selfish. And, and, you know, when I first started doing this and putting health and exercise first, it does feel selfish. So that's a great way to remember that acronym that we must be selfish to put the oxygen mask on ourselves first. It's priority. And I was thinking over the weekend, I actually created a graphic. It was based on Dr. Bruce Perry's concept of the power differential. And it describes the fact that there's this power differential that puts one person at a cognitive disadvantage and can cause significant issues with leadership and communication. Like, for example, how we are interacting, let's say, with a young child, that we must be aware of this power differential. What are some things that trigger the fear that come from the amygdala with this power differential. Can you explain some of that part with um, your scarf as a solution? Well, basically uh, the scarf again are the five triggers that, uh, that these are the five dimensions that trigger the amygdala. The amygdala is a non-thinking entity. It's a very emotional entity. So if you, even if it's a child or an adult you're interacting with, if you remove status, if you remove uh, certainty, if you remove autonomy, if you remove relatedness and fairness, then that will trigger uh, the amygdala and that will generate the kick up the fear response. The fear response shuts down the rational brain. So you will get a child or you will get an adult whom you're interacting with non illogically because it will be in the mix taking over. And we know when the brain works right, everything else is working right. What other strategies do you suggest to better manage our brain and minds and behavior during these times so that we can all move forward with our lives and try to keep routine going? Um, old ways don't open new doors. Uh, there's this saying by Einstein that he defines insanity as doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. The brain, there's only six things you can do with it. Our five senses, and the last is self-talk. The five senses are a state of the fact. If right now you're looking at yellow, it's yellow, unless you're colorblind, of course. So the five senses are factual, but the meaning that you assign to it is up to you. This is a typewriter. This might age me, but I don't know if you were able to, uh, if you uh, encountered this, you look very young, Andrea, but the, to the millennials, this is a typewriter. It, used, it preceded the word processor, it preceded the, the computer. And the thing about it is that it didn't have fonts. It was Steve Jobs who developed the font system. So it only had one font. Now, I also do a lot of coaching to a new recent uh, college graduates. And I would always tell them, if you want to apply for a job, there are two types of fonts that are recommended, serif and sans serif. So what if, Andrea, you're looking, you're looking to hire somebody for your company and you have two applicants, both of them are equally, equally qualified, really uh, dot for dot, they match each other. But the second applicant sent his resume using the font Ravi. Would you hire him? You might think that he's not taking the job uh, opening that seriously. Which P tastes better? Would you say it's the P on the one with the or, uh, ornaments painted on it from the teacup? They actually came from the same teapot. So our perception self-talk 
colors the way we see life. Experience is subjective. You can either carry the world on your shoulder or you can just carry it at the palm of your hand. If you use your brain positively or resourcefully, you don't need to take pills. You can, take, you can actually get this straight self-esteem, happiness, confidence, and peace of mind simply by thinking those thoughts and putting it in your head. Uh, Albert Einstein, who was voted by Time Magazine to be the person of the century, had this very famous equation, E is equal to MC squared. And this is actually, I use this for neuroscience, E is for emotions. Emotions come from the self-talk that we assign to the five senses. And these are the building blocks of our memories. So we get a lot of emotions, depending on culture, depending on upbringing. Emotions are one to a person. We might experience the same reality, but we will react to it different emotionally. The second one, and that is relegated to amygdala. The amygdala is emotional. It's not thinking. So when something happens, mix assign an, assigns an emotion to it. The second one is memory. Uh, Andrea, let me know if this next picture will, you will uh, remember tomorrow. If something is memorable, you will remember it. Uh, <laughs> sounds redundant. Uh, that's why if you want to teach, uh, which is what I'm trying to do, make it humorous and absurd. So you, the emotions are the currency for our memories. The memories actually now form our mindsets. It's either memorable or unmemorable and we just tend to carry our memorable experiences. We put it in our head. And then the last is that our memories form our cognitive conditioning, which is assigned to text, our rational brain. So again, we have E C equal to MC squared. We have emotions, which are the currency of our memories. And then the memories form our cognitive conditioning, which is our habits. When you do a Google search, Andrea, who types in the search words? I do. Uh, yes. And most people think that it's the auto also correct with us. No, I can be foolish enough to type in problems in my life. And guess what? I will just get everything that are problems in my life. And I was looking for, I was the one who typed it in. Or I can type in things I can be thankful for. And guess what? I will now be looking at things that I will be thankful for. You and I are in control of the keyboard. The keyboard will not type itself. We type in what we want to see, and what we see dominates our emotions, which forms memories, which forms our cognitive conditioning. We can either be chained really, or it can actually be the shoelaces of our uh, sneakers, which we can just snap off with a jerk. Carlos Castaneda, who's an American author, said, the trick is what one emphasizes. We either make ourselves miserable, or we make ourselves strong. The amount of work is the same, I repeat. The trick is what one emphasizes. We can either make ourselves miserable or we can make ourselves strong. The amount of work is the same. So people are wondering why we're picking up problems where problems don't actually exist. You and I are in full control of the keyboard. Isn't it, there's this concept that I heard of, and, and I forget what it is right now, but it's the concept that when we're looking for something, our brain will see that thing. Like if you've seen a certain car, let's say yes. a red car, you're going to see that red car everywhere. So what you're looking for, you're going to see all the time. Or someone says, I went to Botswana, and you're like, where is Botswana? Suddenly, Botswana is all over the it's news. It's everywhere. What, what is that concept called? Do you, do you know? Yeah. Uh, I don't. I, I know what you're referring to. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a similar brain uh, phenomenon. Our conscious mind is inundated with 40 million bits. It's bits and bytes of computer jargon. Our conscious mind is inundated with 40 million bits of information per second but the conscious mind can only handle 40 bits per second. So we're overwhelmed with 40 million bits, but our conscious mind can only handle 40. So where does the balance go? It goes to our subconscious mind. Andrea, may I request you to do something? Can yeah. you fold your arms? Yeah. Uh, is it right over left or left over right? Right over left. Can you try doing it reverse? 
left over, right? Yeah, it does feel weird the other way. Yes, and uh, but you and I would know that it should technically be easy. Any child can do it. And also, if I were to ask you, Andrea, when did you think and decide in your life that effective today, if somebody from the Philippines were to ask me to cross my arms, I would do it right over left. Do you know a date when you decided that? No, no idea. No, it's totally subconscious. It went from the 40 million bits, it went down to your subconscious programming. And Andrea, you and I are 15 hours away by time, but I can tell some things about you. You also wear your sweater in the same way. And you also wear your trousers in the same way, right first before the left. Am I right? <laughs> and that's a, that's a subconscious programming. It's not good or bad, it's, it just is. And if you try to change it, even though it's not nuclear science or rocket science, it's unnatural. So because our brain can only handle 40 bits and we're inundated with 40 million bits, our brain takes shortcuts. They're called biases. And this would explain some of the behavior that you, we saw during COVID. Uh, there are very famous by the first is bandwagon effect. When you see a lot of people doing it, we stop analyzing it and we just assume that they're correct, we follow them. And perhaps the behavior that you're referring to, Andrew, is called confirmation bias. We tend to be selective in what we see and we only try to look for what confirms our beliefs. So if I believe that everybody from Arizona can think are good people, then I, anything that is against that, I will refuse. And anything that supports it, I will embrace. So that might be in line with what you're referring to. Uh, also, Henry David Thoreau, he, he's actually a philosopher. He says, it's not what you look at that matters. It's what you see. But you're right about the phenomenon that if you think about a red car, all of a sudden, everywhere you go, there's a red car. Uh, it, it might be confirmation bias in neuroscience, or it might be something else. But you and I understand each other across the miles and across the time zones. Absolutely, Ben, this is powerful and it's making me think really deeply and make connections. From all the work that you've been doing all over the world with neuro-linguistic programming and neuro-coaching and business executives, what do you see as some of the most common reasons that people become stuck with their results? So why do you think we should all know and what should we all know and practice daily to improve our personal and professional results with the brain in mind? Let, let me, I think the best one is uh, illustration. Andrea, do you feel any discomfort right now in your body? Sure, yes. I've always uh, Well, can, can you be specific? Is it a back pain? Is it a shoulder pain? Uh, always neck pain. Neck pain, okay. Uh, guys, don't do this at home. And I'm a pro professional, but uh, Andrea and I, we just met tonight. Andrea, can you take your right hand and put it, uh, no, before that, can you, what are you feeling on your shoulders that you pointed to? Well, how would you call the sensation? Just annoying, neck pain. Annoying, okay. Uh, calibrate that feeling of annoying one to 10, one being it's okay, and then 10 is it really annoys me big time. Like seven-ish. Seven-ish, okay. Now take your right hand, put it in, in the area that is annoying, and imagine that all that sensation, annoying sensation on your shoulders is concentrated into a ball. Get that ball into your right hand, and you're not, and now you're not, ho you're not holding in your right hand the ball which represents the pain that you feel in your shoulder that you refer to as annoying. You got it? Yes. And then now stretch your hand, full arms left. So Mr. Annoying or Miss Annoying, where gender equal, is already arms length away from you. And annoying, annoying person would, could no longer annoy you. And do this. Smash it. OK, Andrea, calibrate. It's, it's way less, and, and I completely agree with this. Hypnosis helps me more than going to the chiropractor. Like a simple yes. thing of using my own brain. This hyp hypnosis guy taught me how to 
do this while I'm driving or while I'm working or doing a presentation. Something as simple as what you just did is more effective than me going to the chiropractor. I have no idea why. Right. And then now let's, let's take it uh, down to start something more pleasant. Uh, although now we're able to go out of our homes, uh, what was the food that you missed the most during the quarantine period? Um, probably just the experience of going and, and eating that food in a restaurant because we could get it to take home, but the experience right. of eating it in the restaurant is different. Food tastes different than at home. Right now, imagine your favorite restaurant. Do you have one in mind? Yes. Assume, uh, imagine that you're eating there now. Uh, what feeling would you assign it to? Uh, joy, delight? Yeah, fun, peaceful. Okay, calibrate a fun and peaceful with your imagination right now. Okay. One to ten. What uh, number would you assign? It? Oh, how how my, I'm experiencing ten for sure because I'm thinking All right. how fun it's going to be. Right. Now imagine and work with me that you went into that restaurant. And again, we never discussed what type of restaurant it was. Uh, neuroscience is absolutely content independent. We don't care about the content. A psychological therapy would ask you about your childhood, how's your relationship with your siblings. In our case, we don't care now that. We just care about how you structure your memory. So imagine that you're going to that restaurant that you thought of, and when you're just driving past, you and your husband are parking, Wow, the restaurant became 10 times bigger. And you see spotlights coming from UFOs focusing on the restaurant. It's now very vivid, very bright. And you hear your favorite music uh, that's danceable and something that's upbeat playing. And you can smell your favorite food. And everybody's saying, go, 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 Andrea. Calibrate. Fun, peaceful. Well, oh, ten definitely. You can. I can create. Can you go twenty? Would it exceed ten? Oh, definitely. Because right, with my brain. I can recreate it. Right. So the way we structured memory. Actually, if I were to say, Andrea, can you imagine the restaurant to be blurred in black and white? It would now go down from ten, perhaps to seven. So the way we think of our memories actually impacts how we feel about it. The memory per se is a memory. It, we cannot un, uh, unscramble scrambled eggs. But how we think, how we code the memory, given our five senses, has a very big impact on how we feel about it moving forward. So if somebody hurt us in the past, if we cling on to it and code it in a way that magnifies it, in our example, we make it closer to us, we make it large, we make it magnified, it intensifies the memory. So if you want a memory to be magnified, if you want a happy memory to be magnified, BBC, big, bright, colorful. Think of it as big, think of it as bright, and think of it as colorful. And the positive memory would be amplified. If you want to mitigate a negative memory, do reverse. Think of it as reverse of big, think of it as small, think of it opposite as bright, dull, and colorful, make it black and white. So if you are trying to grapple with a negative memory, try to keep it away from you, that what we did, keep it a distance away from you, and code it in a way that your brain no longer hungers for it because it's, it's dull. It's small, it's blurred, it's black and white. So to your question, Andrea, the way we code, people are stuck because they choose to paint their memories in the same way that was not resourceful anyway in the past, they know that it's not resourceful, but perhaps they don't know any better. Hopefully after this podcast, they now know that they have choices. They're at the keyboard, control the keyboard, they can, they can type in any search word they want, or they can choose to structure their memories in a way that will either amplify a happy memory or mitigate a negative memory. Wow, Ben, I've never really thought about taking a memory that you don't want to keep and and demagnifying it like I've never really thought about that it makes sense though because if we can remember the positive memories we can also forget the negative ones absolutely that's that's amazing that's almost 
mind boggling right there. Ben, from everything that you've been teaching, what strategies do you find most useful in your own personal and professional life from all of these concepts? Uh, I apply what we just uh, talked about. I make sure that if I'm experiencing, uh, for example, I'm a public speaker, that's why I'm used to mass gatherings and now we're forced to do things virtually, social distancing. But way back then, if I had a very good response, I hear the audience clapping and I can see their faces, I would anchor it. And I do that by looking at them and try to amplify the memory. If it's louder right the way they're clapping, I'm imagining it in my head even louder. I'm imagining them big, as big as the building. And then I do something that's called a kinesthetic anchor or a physical anchor. I do this. I cup my right fingers and I touch my left shoulder only because it's something unnatural to do. I had a client who wanted to anchor energy. He wants to feel energetic. And he chose to anchor a handshake. So if he, somebody shook his hand right before bedtime, he would feel energetic. So you want to anchor something using a, a physical activity that is unusual. So uh, touching your left shoulder is rather unusual. Before I would go on stage, I would uh, clench my face on the left. That's my anchor for the green face on. I'm right-handed, so normally I clench my face on the right. So clenching my face on the left is something unnatural for me. So I've anchored myself that if I were to speak in a coliseum like Tony Robbins, perhaps, uh, 40 million, uh, 40,000 people, I would clench my uh, left fist. Otherwise, I would be pissing in my pants and shaking in my legs. So that would give me a positive anchor. So mm -hmm. when I wake up, I, I, I make a deliberate effort to make sure that I see the day, I see the next 24 hours positively. Anything that is going to deter me from that uh, deliberate and purposeful move, I try to negate them by constructing them in my memory in a way that mitigates them. So I greet my wife, uh, whom you met earlier. I greet my dogs, and I always say a prayer, and I always say, thank you, Lord, for a new day. It's something deliberate. Things will always come out of left field. We cannot control whether it rains. It's now rainy season here in the Philippines. We only have two seasons, wet and dry, so it's now rainy hard uh, but you know you can dance in the rain we are all in the same ocean but we don't have to be in the same boat so we choose the boat that we ride in oh i love it ben th this has been incredible i just want to review if we can these concepts and and i'm i'm sure i'm not going to forget batman because the idea of the amygdala being the fear part and the prefrontal cortex, once the amygdala is firing, that shuts down and I can't think. Yes. Um, can you just uh, review Batman's scarf score and maybe selfish just to make sure that we've all got it before we close up and, and go on through for our day? All right. Uh, first of all, the way we memorize things is through association. So we think of Batman, score, and scarf. Batman is the study of the B brain, how it A acts, and how it B thinks, so that you can man manage your behavior. And then the brain looks for score. It seeks for S, survival, C, certainty, and then R, relatedness or relationships. The amygdala is the emotional part of your brain. It is always on the lookout for threats whether real or perceived. And when it finds a threat, whether real or perceived, it activates a fear response, which is freeze, fight, or fight. Those are non-rational, totally illogical emotions. And then it shuts down your thinking process. The amygdala has a 10 second lead time. It comes in quicker. It has a 10 second lead time over your prefrontal cortex. So if, if you're in, in a bind and you're finding yourself in rage, count to 10, slowly 1,001, 1,002, let uh, MIGs and text catch up. Let text catch up, then you can now say, is this issue really worth my time getting upset over? You can now think with the prefrontal cortex and think impassionately, calmly, and emotionally, logically, deliberately. And then there are five drivers that trigger MIGs or the amygdala to get 
wild. And that's SCAR. S is for status, C is for certainty, A is for autonomy, R is for relate relatedness, and F is for fairness. So if you want to be a good leader, you just treat your team with SCAR. Treat them with, uh, without diminishing their status. Treat them with certainty. Provide them autonomy or choices. Uh, provide them relatedness or include them, make them feel at home, and treat them with fairness. If you're experiencing an emotional problem, you can analyze and dissect the problem by putting it across the template. Is this problem that I'm feeling an issue with status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, or fairness? Chances are it will fall in one of them or uh, many of them. If it doesn't fall in any of them, then it's not a problem because uh, if it doesn't fall in any of them, it's a real problem because those five problems are amygdala driven, meaning they're irrational, emotional problems. So if it doesn't fall in any of them, or for example, it's a matter of injustice, you, you got fired illegally, then you know you can seek legal remedy, you can go to court, you can litigate. But you are now on the step toward movement, rather than being stuck thinking about the problem, uh, churning it like a cow, you can now go step forward into movement and action. Uh, and in closing, and again, I'd like to say, Andrea, from the bottom of my heart, love from Manila to you and your family. It's an honor to be a guest in your top rating global podcast in neuroscience. I'd like to pose this question to your listeners. What's the difference between an excellent game and game excellence? An excellent game makes you win the game. Game excellence makes you win the championship. And if you focus on understanding your brain, guys, keep on listening to Andrea's podcast. If you get more and more of the knowledge of the brain, the human brain defines who you are. It determines how you act. It determines how you think. It is the most important organ of the body. Yet most of us know more about how our phones work than how our brains work. So listen to Andrea's podcast. You can follow me on LinkedIn or on Facebook also. And once you get that, you will get, you will get life excellence. You can now live life on your own terms. Make sure that you know your brain. Make sure that your brain is on. Sometimes you talk to people who have brains, but it's off. And then you can think out of the box. Andrea, it's been a joy and delight talking with you and to your global fans about the subject that is dear to my heart, the brain, and how it influences our behavior. Oh, Ben, this has been incredible. Thank you so much for this information broken down in this way so that we can remember and then apply. And as we've been preparing for this interview, I've been learning so much. If people want to look, continue to learn from you, they can find you at benampill.com, follow you at Ben Ampill on LinkedIn. You post some powerful things over there. Twitter and Facebook, and you're all over the media. So it's not difficult to find you. If you go anywhere, just put your name in. Thank you for everything you're doing to help the world and for all of us to just continue this strategy of selfish and work on ourselves to be better people in the world. Thank you so much, Ben. My pleasure and allow me to close with a favorite saying of mine. If we don't mind our mind, we would not be able to manage our behavior. Andrea, blessings to you and your household, blessings to you and your podcast. And I declare blessings upon the world. We need it more now. And we can do it by taking it one step at a time. And let's love each other, not hurt each other. Thank you so much for inviting me, Andrea. Thank you, Ben.